um, in this week there is going to, some of us we are going to grow in our obedience to the faith and some of us we are going to be made disciples for his name's sake it's the grace that is on my life it is what my apostleship is about maybe it is this week in the month where it is okay to call me that title i, I rarely use that title as many of you may have noticed but in this week i operate with that title <laughs> i even sometimes fear to use it to say it okay but the scripture says uh, that we have received our apostleship to promote obedience to the faith and to make disciples for his name's sake and i always say this so that you know what to expect you know what to pray for you know uh, what to place a demand for because you know the grace that is available the anointing that is flowing what we expect is that in this week you are being to the faith uh, our common faith the faith that we have handed to from Jesus our obedience to it shall increase and then that we will be made disciples if we are already disciples we will become better disciples amen I always teach in the Bible school that there are five, five things that uh, five marks of a true disciple of course number one a true disciple is one who has come to the Lord Jesus. Okay? He told us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then, verse 20 says, well, that is Matthew 28 that I just uh, quoted. Verse 20 says, teaching them to observe everything that I have taught you. So, the second thing about disciples having come to the Lord they are teachable okay a true disciple is teachable and I thank God for you 5 a.m. you are awake with your notebooks it shows that you are a disciple my my job is to make you a better disciple is to make you an excellent disciple disciples are teachable number three we know that disciples they love one another in john chapter 13 i think it is verse 35 where he says by this they shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another so two disciples walk in love and that should be a distinguishing mark of us as disciples that we are walking in love how together so far you know because when we are making disciples we should also know what we are making okay yeah they have come to Christ they are teachable uh, they walk in love uh, then uh, the other the other mark of a disciple is that uh, disciples they count the cost they count the cost Jesus spoke and said nobody who puts the, their hand on the plow and looks back is worthy of me disciples they count the cost 
<laughs> he said whoever does not hate his father and mother and brothers and sister cannot be my disciple eh, I never thought about that for us to be his disciple we must hate and people sometimes think ah uh, is this hating our parents and brothers and sisters literally no this means that relative to Christ I must love him more than I love my father mother brother sister he must be number one yes he must be number one. He must be number one. He must be top priority. So one of the things that we hope to achieve with these seminars is that we have children of God who have prioritized Him, uh, who have paid the, who have counted the cost. Uh, disciples, we know that disciples also, um, they. He carried it. It says, uh, Whoever wants to follow me must deny himself, must deny himself, uh, carry his cross daily, and follow. Okay, so true disciples deny themselves, their interests, and what. Are those five, or there is a fifth? And my students in discipleship in the Bible school can remind me if there is one mark of a disciple that I have forgotten. Okay, so when we are making disciples of the nations, this is what we are making. This is who we are making. Hallelujah. Uh, well, which one is the fifth? I said they have come to Christ. Uh, they walk in love. Uh, they are teachable, uh, they account the cost, which one is uh, number five, mm. faith, sacred, my students, mm. which one is number five, mm. from him we have received grace and apostleship promote obedience put Christ above their interests aha I talked about put Christ above their interests faith has got it right disciples practice God's word uh -huh. John chapter 8 verse 31 Bible says Jesus was you know he was talking to the Jews who had believed and it says to the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, then you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You see, to the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are truly my disciples. In those scriptures, we see that there is a difference between a believer and a disciple. The Jews who had believed, he told them, if you hold on to my teaching, then you will be my disciples. So, from believer to disciple takes practicing. Get that? From believer to disciple takes practicing. There is a, a journey of practicing what the, the word that you know so that you take the step from being, yes, Lord, the one who confessed Jesus as Lord, to being a disciple. Are we together? Yes. So when we are saying we have received the apostleship to make disciples uh, we have received apostleship to make people who practice God's word people who are practicing believers uh -huh. 
Hallelujah. The other scripture that I want you to keep in mind as we are having this session is Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number. It's verse what? Verse 11, I think, which talks about the other aspect of my job description. His gifts were varied. Himself appointed, gave men to us, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, uh, and teachers. Twelve. His intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints that they should do the work of ministering towards building up Christ's body. That verse 12 is what happens in this seminar. As one of the fivefold ministers, my job is to perfect and to equip the saints. First of all, glory to God, those of us who are here, I want to announce to you that you are a saint. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some people struggle with that. Okay. Somebody could have been wondering, am I really a saint? There it is. There, there, there. His intention was the perfecting and full equipping of the saints. The saints. That's why I struggle. I struggle to say I am a sinner. Because I can't be a sinner and a saint at the same time. It's double personality. I could be schizophrenic. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God made him who knew no sin to become sin. So that in him I might become the righteousness of God. Okay, so I am the righteousness of God, and uh, God is always doing the work of sanctification in me, so that I can, my soul and my body can reflect what is already uh, a done deal in my spirit. Hallelujah. In my spirit man, I am righteous. In my spirit man, I am. Ah, but that's for another day. Why am I talking about those things? I was just trying to tell you that you are saints. Hallelujah. Now, in this um, uh, week, we take the time to perfect, okay? And to equip, glory to God, to equip the saints. And then we do the work of ministering towards building up Christ's body. At the end of these five days, I am praying for you, and you should pray for yourself, that you will be built up. Korabo Sandara. That you will be built up. Build, um, that your faith will be built up. That your spiritual life will be built up. That, you know, if you've not been praying for the sick, uh, that you, at the end of these days, you will be stirred up to pray for the sick. Uh, if you have been praying for the sick and they are not getting healed, that you start praying for them and start getting results. Being, generally, being built up means even you yourself can say there is a difference in my life. Being built up means that you know that I was at point A, now I'm at point C. Okay? Uh, my, my intention is that we will be Christians that are progressive, that, that are moving, you know, not on one mountain. Yesterday I was preaching about how the children of Israel uh, were rotating on one place, uh, on the same mountain, until God got tired of their sight. I said, you have been here for a long time. And uh, I was telling people that when you are not obedient to God, you stay in the same place. But obedience causes you to move. Uh, hallelujah. So this week we are going to be built up. Glory to God. We are going to be built up. 
and we are talking about uh, staying on fire. Now I can come to the theme of the week. We are talking about staying on fire. I've been on fire uh, since I had an encounter with God in 1990. Uh, I can tell you without apology that I've been on fire since 1999. So I have a few things to share with us. I have a few things to share with us. I have been uh, giving my tithe since 1999. So when I talk about staying on fire as far as giving is concerned, I have a few things to talk about. Hmm. I would mean staying on fire. The Bible says in uh, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 6 verse 13, it says the fire on the altar must never get out. Leviticus chapter 6 verse 13. That's the first scripture I want us to read. And that's the scripture I want us to keep it at the back of our mind throughout this week. Staying on fire. When when the Lord told me that is what we are going to handle uh, in this uh, seminar week, uh, this scripture came to my mind. Hmm? The fire shall be burning continually upon the altar it shall not go out now for you to understand uh of yeah, for you to get the uh, the where this scripture is taking us without thinking that we are talking about the law since you have seen the book leviticus you know there are many people who are allergic to leviticus Every time somebody mentions Leviticus, they say, ah, ah, taking us back to the law. Yet we are all the uh, new covenant, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> My friend, Leviticus is in the Bible. And uh, we are called to, to speak the whole counsel of God. If we are called to speak the whole counsel of God, then those who are here as are called to hear the whole counsel of God and believe the whole counsel of God. But you have to be able to read the New Testament in light of the Old and read the Old Testament in light of the New. What I've said is extremely important. If you want maturity as a child of God, you must learn to read the New Testament in light of the Old and the Old Testament in light of the New. You can't read one without the other. Are we together? Glory to God. Are we, uh, so, the, the, the fire shall be burning continually upon the altar. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a physical temple. Okay? There was a physical temple. This altar that the scripture is talking about, where God says the fire must continue to be burning. This altar was in that physical temple. Are you with me? In the New Testament, the Bible says, you and I, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. Are you now getting it? Are you seeing now how I am reading Leviticus 6.13 in light of the New Testament? Because the altar in Leviticus is in a physical temple. In New Testament, I am the temple. The, the, the mystery of the New Testament is that I am the temple and I'm also the sacrifice. <laughs> In the old covenant, there was a physical temple and there were sacrifices of sheep, always. 
and the fire was supposed to continually burn. In the New Testament, he says, I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to present yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your spiritual act of worship. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, it talks about how, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? So, I am a temple, and I am also the sacrifice. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, the, that's the mystery that we have to live with, that we are the temple, we are also the sacrifice. And in this temple, God says, the fire on the altar of our hearts, Kadose must never go out. Do you now get it? You are the temple, you are also the sacrifice. Uh, and then, the difference between the sacrifice in the old and the sacrifice in the new, the sacrifices in the Old Testament were dead. The sacrifices in the New Testament are living, which is good and bad at the same time. Because, like we all know, when you're a living sacrifice, the, there is a tendency to crawl off the altar. Kodesh. Living sacrifices crawl off the altar. Ask any pastor, he will tell you, he has to confront crawling sacrifices. She was an usher, she's an usher, she was expecting to be at church, she was expected to do this and that. She just doesn't show off, she doesn't show up, she doesn't mention why she hasn't showed up. She's just not there. She just crawled off the altar. It was minister so and so. He was in charge of ABC. We had all agreed he was going to be in charge of ABC. At the time of doing ABC, minister so and so, the phone is off. Or minister tells you five minutes to the activity that I'm sorry. Ah, something has come up. I can't be there. They have crawled off the altar. And uh, that's why I keep telling uh, my people that I always have plan B and C and D, sometimes up to J, because you're dealing with crawling sacrifices. They crawl off the altar. Sometimes even you yourself, you're the one who is about to crawl off. They don't know. But for us, we don't have much of a luxury of crawling off. Because me, I don't have the luxury of not showing up. Because there has to be a preacher. There has to be somebody. So I don't have the luxury of crawling off. But many people have the luxury of crawling off. I mean, uh, I just... Uh, I just traveled. I'm tired. I'll go to church next Sunday. I don't have that luxury. But many have that luxury. I mean, let me crawl off this Sunday. I'll go next Sunday. <laughs> Are you getting this? Hey, ask your neighbor for me. Uh, have you been crawling off the altar? We, 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 we all have the tenets of crawling off. The challenge is when you're always off, like you crawled off and you never came back. You never came back. You crawl off. And, and that's why we have, this, we have this seminar. Because a number of us, when the year was starting, said, Lord, I give myself to you. I give myself away. <laughs> oh, I give myself away. 
so you can use me. And we promised God things. Said, Lord, this year, I'm going to seek you. This is July. We look back and realize, my God, I crawled off the altar. <laughs> the things you are promising God to do, you did them and somewhere around March, you crawled off. Because there is always the, 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 the tendency, the tendency is usually to crawl off. So there has to be intentional climbing back onto the altar. The, the tendency is to, Lord, this year I want to read the book of John and finish it. I've not even gone into New Testament or the whole Bible. This year, Lord, I want to also finish a book in the Bible. And you look back and you stopped at John chapter 4. What happened? You crawled off the altar. Because you are a living sacrifice. Living sacrifices means they are sacrifices, but their eyes are open. So can be on the altar and see the destruction on the other side. Say, ah, let me go and check that. Living sacrifices. That, that is why you find you are in a prayer meeting and you're on WhatsApp. You are a living sacrifice. You, you have the battle. And let me help you to understand the battle that you are on. You know, that you're doing your Bible study, but you're checking Twitter and whatever. You're a living sacrifice. Mm. That's the challenge that you have, that your eyes are open yeah. while you're on the altar. That's why you must stay there and the fire keeps burning those things. Mm. Are you getting where we are going with this? <laughs> it's a good place where we are going. It's a good place. Mm. Crawl back on, climb back onto the altar. Mm. Climb back onto the altar. The things that you promised God to do, Lord, I want to pray uh, every morning this year. Lord, I want to attend the church without walls. Lord, I want to do that. <laughs> One of the things I never forget is the picture, you know, the, the, the new year, how believers gather in those stadiums, and then they put up those papers with their requests and what they are all. It's always a beautiful sight. Around July, maybe we should also have some other overnights around July when we start the second half of the year, and again put up the papers. Mm. Hallelujah. Are you with me? The fire, the fire, the fire on the altar, God says, it must never go out. So we are gathered here, children of God, to rekindle fires that were going out. And, you know, as the year goes on, a number of things come through. Uh, some things you expected, they don't work like you expected disappointments come here and there, uh, things don't turn out the way you expect, and so the fire just, you know, kind of goes down and what? We are here to rekindle the fire. Hallelujah. If your fire was going out, if your fire, there's a scripture that I'll keep reading again and again, uh, Proverbs 26, 20, verse 8. It says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out. Uh -huh. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. So the fire could have gone out because uh, maybe you ran out of wood or maybe you uh, didn't have enough wood. So we are going to be putting more wood in the fire we are going to be showing you more wood mm. in the name of jesus we are going to it says for lack of wood the fire goes out which means the reverse is true for presence of wood the fire stays on mm -hmm. 
when you have the wood, when you have the right wood, the fire, the, the, those uh, the virgins, the story of the five, and uh, there were five who were wise and five who were, you know, the other one. The ones who ran out of, of uh, whose candles and lights were getting out is because they hadn't carried extra, what? Extra oil. And when it was approaching midnight, they, their oil started running out. And, uh, you know, in Proverbs, it is wood. In the new, uh, in, in the Gospels, it is about the oil. Uh, but it is the same thing, okay? We are going to be putting more oil. Uh, we are going to be showing you uh, some wood that you may not have discovered. That if you have it, your fire will keep burning. Hallelujah! Yes. So, sit tight. Uh, I want you to invite as many people as possible. God is going to be giving us some really uh, nice wood because it is why it's possible to be on fire is because being on fire is God's idea. Jesus came, one of his primary roles, John said uh, that uh, it is Matthew three eleven I think, he says, I baptize you with water because of repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy of you to take off or carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Eh? See what Jesus does? John, his announcer, declared what his assignment was to baptize us. Now, you can pray that prayer throughout these five days. You can say, Lord, baptize me in the Holy Spirit and in fire. <coughs> Excuse me. It is God's idea for you to be on fire. Yeah. It is God's idea. Jesus came to baptize us in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Mm. It is God's idea. There is another scripture <laughs> where Jesus said he, he declared something. In Luke chapter 12, verse 49, he said, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Can you imagine? I have come to bring fire. <laughs> Luke 12, 49, I have come to bring fire on earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. So, when we talk about fire, it is not man's idea it is not our idea it is god's idea as a matter of fact the bible calls god a consuming fire he is a consuming fire hallelujah so that means that we are going to be running to god again and again and again for fire because he is the source of fire hallelujah we are going to be asking him, baptize me in the Holy Spirit and fire. And after he has baptized me in the Holy Spirit and fire, I'm going to say, Lord, show me the wood that I need to keep this fire burning. Hallelujah. So this whole uh, week, I'll be showing you uh, the, uh, the pieces of wood that God has showed me over the years and when you keep having these pieces of wood and putting them you will stay on fire you will stay on fire i tell you uh, marriage marriage is great when the two people are on fire mm. you do your work better when you're on fire for god when we talk about this fire, it's not just about preaching. It's not just about whatever. I'm talking about having a continuous passion, having a continuous fire burning in you know, that blue flame that it burns and affects your work. You are excellent at the workplace. It burns and affects your relationships. You are a good person to be around. The fire burns and, you know, 
It affects your relationship with your family member. The fire burns and it affects your prayer life. You, prayer is no longer a drag to you. you. You actually long to pray. You love to pray. The fire burns and you, you enjoy your Bible reading. You don't tolerate your Bible reading. You enjoy it. The fire burns and you, you, you like what you're doing. Uh, the fire burns and you give cheerfully. Uh, the, you know, the fire affects every aspect of your life. Hallelujah. So I welcome you to the week of fire. I welcome you to the week where we shall discuss how we can stay on fire. Of course, when we are on fire, we will avoid having that temperature which God hates. Uh, Darius mentioned it when he was praying. There is a temperature that God hates. We need to know it. He would rather, he would actually rather you are uh, uh, cold uh, or hot, not that other temperature. You know that other temperature. And I have learned that to be on the good side of God, I must love what he loves and hate what he hates. Now, he hates that lukewarm temperature. One of the few, I don't know, it might even be the only portion in scripture where they talk about God spitting. When they talk about God spitting, it is in that verse. The ones who are lukewarm that he will spit them out of his mouth. Is that how bad it is? Just picture God spitting. He hates that temperature. So being on fire will help me to not have that temperature which God hates. Hallelujah. So we thank God for you, uh, for bringing you, and um, it's going to be a good time. Make sure that you invite somebody for the last time session, and in the evening, of course, we are going to be ministering to the sick. I have noticed uh, lately that the grace uh, on my life for healing has increased, so uh, if you're sick, or if you have somebody who's sick, uh, let them listen in. Attend with them. Who knows what God is going to do. Hallelujah. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for today. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for this week. We thank you for what you are going to do. Uh, and those who are giving, uh, let me pray for those who want to give. Uh, you can put those lines there. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for everybody who is going to give this morning. And those who are going to give the whole week. I pray that you will minister to them in a mighty way. In the mighty name of Jesus. That what you say concerning givers, it shall come to pass in their life. That you shall cause all grace to abound to them. That having all that they need at all times, they shall abound in every good work. That you shall supply all their needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. So 